Everybody. Yeah. Rock your body. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody. Rock your body, right? Backtrack's back. All right. Greetings one and all, and welcome back to Tom's Hit Parade. Uh, yes, bringing you a Backtracks today, my first Backtracks of the new year and the new decade. Uh, yeah, that's the one bad thing about taking half a month off is that I've got half the time to do the two regular features I like to film and edit and upload for you every month, uh, Bargain Bag and Backtracks. Of course, I filmed Bargain Bag back when I was doing my year-end list, so that part of it was out of the way. But still, it feels like a bit of a time crunch, you know, only two weeks to do all this stuff. So, uh, but yeah, I still, I love bringing them to you uh, every month. I, for some reason, I love the research part of Backtracks. Uh, and to that end, um, a little surprise for you folks, I have decided at the last minute, well, the last minute being about a week ago as I was writing the notes, this is the second year in a row that I will be expanding Backtracks back another five years. So yes, starting this month, I will be giving you albums celebrating their 65th anniversaries. Yeah, I, I kind of looked into it on a whim as I was, as I said, as, as I was writing the notes for Backtracks, decided to just check out the albums released in 1955 to see if there were enough that, uh, you know, enough noteworthy albums that I could pin down the release months for. And it turns out there were, there were just enough. Truth be told, there were uh, a few, I fell a few short. And let me explain here. Uh, about two-thirds of the albums I'll be talking about for the year of 1955, I was able to confirm the month of release. The other two-thirds are split about evenly between albums that I can only block out to a certain part of the year uh, based on the uh, recording dates that were available online. You know, it's like, for instance, if an album was recorded in June and July of 1955, it wasn't released in March of 1955, right? I decided to conjecture about two months after the last recording session from there through the end of the month was the most uh, logical time that they would have been released. So, And the other ones that last oh, one-sixth, roughly, of the albums, no way to narrow down the month of release at all. So basically, I took those and put them into months where I, was fe uh, I fell short of albums to mention. So, by the way, if any of you know of a really exhaustive uh, clearinghouse of music, trivia, and information, and album... Uh, stuff. Uh, let me know about it. I go to My go-to sources are Wikipedia and AllMusic. Uh, Discogs has some information, but yeah, other than that, sometimes, and especially the older the albums are, the more difficult uh, information is to come by on those albums. So, uh, bottom line here, I am not knowingly giving you any erroneous information. I'm just doing the best I can. And, you know, I just, as I said, there were some albums of fairly signif significant note. Uh, released in 1955 that I wanted to mention. And as I said, I love doing backtracks. Just wanted to, uh, you know, give you guys a little more fun. But anyway, uh, since the album's rundown is going to take a little bit longer going forward since I've added an anniversary year, let's just go ahead and get to it, shall we? Yes, for those of you who are new to my channel, Backtracks is my monthly rundown of notable album anniversaries divisible by five with at least one spotlight album review. And yes, divisible by five in every sense of the word, literally, this case, in, for this year, not only are my anniversary years divisible by five, as they always are, but this year, the target years are divisible by five. So, yay math! So let's just get the ball rolling here and see which albums are celebrating anniversaries for the month of January 2020. 65 years ago this month, Joe Stafford released her album Soft and Sentimental. Featured amongst this 10-inch LP six tracks are her versions of the Johnny Mercer composition Early Autumn, which reached number 23 on the pop chart, the Gershwin tune Love is Here to Stay, and the Harry Warren Al Dubin song September in the Rain. Also released in January of 1955 was Johnny Ray's sophomore album I Cry For You. Also a six track 10 inch LP, this set includes the top 10 charting pop hits Please Mr. Sun and Here I Am Broken Hearted, both of which featured the four lads on backing vocals, and the standard All of Me, which reached number 12 on the pop charts. Both of these releases were part of Columbia Records' House Party album series. January of 1960 saw the release of John Coltrane's fifth album, Giant Steps. It was his first album for the Atlantic label. Recorded two weeks after his final sessions for Miles Davis's Kind of Blue, this album includes several compositions that went on to become jazz standards, including Naima and the title track. The album was added to the Library of Congress's National Recording Registry in 2004 and earned gold certification by the RIAA in 2018. Also released six decades ago this month was Bobby Darin's third album, This Is Darin. 
that was somewhat of an ironic title considering it was his first album to not include any original tunes. It peaked number six on the Billboard Albums chart during its 50-week run. It includes the songs My Gal Sal, Guys and Dolls, the Duke Ellington classic Caravan, and the Harold Arlen Ira Gershwin tune The Gal That Got Away. 55 years ago this month, The Zombies released their self-titled debut album. Along with the hit single She's Not There, which reached number 12 on the UK singles chart and peaked at number 2 in the US and Canada, the album includes interpretations of the Gershwin standard Summertime, the blues classic I Got My Mojo Workin', and a medley of Smokey Robinson's You've Really Got a Hold On Me and Sam Cooke's Bring It On Home To Me. The album's track list was modified, it was retitled Begin Here, and released as the band's debut album in the UK three months later. Also released in January of 1965 was Scylla Black's debut album, Scylla. It spent 11 weeks on the UK albums chart, peaking at number 5, and features her renditions of Going Out of My Head, originally by Little Anthony and the Imperials, Dancing in the Street by Martha and the Vandellas, the Cole Porter standard You'd Be So Nice to Come Home To, and the Back Rack David tunes Baby It's You and This Empty Place. Half a century ago, Johnny Cash released his 33rd album, Hello, I'm Johnny Cash. It peaked at number one on the Billboard Country Albums chart and number six on the Pop chart, and was certified gold within a month of release. Cash and his wife, June Carter Cash, earned a Grammy for Best Country Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocals for their duet, If I Were a Carpenter, which was a top five hit on the Country Singles chart and a top 40 hit on the Pop chart. The album's other two singles, Blistered and See Ruby Fall, were also top five country hits. See Ruby Fall was co-written by Roy Orbison, and the album also includes Cash's first cover of a Chris Christopherson song, To Beat the Devil. Also released in January of 1970 was American Woman, the Guess Who's sixth album and their most successful release. It peaked at number nine on the Billboard Pop Albums chart and remained on the chart for over a year. The first single, No Time, hit the top five of the Billboard Hot 100 and number one on the Canadian singles chart, and was a remake of a track that appeared on their previous album, Canned Wheat. The title track, probably the band's most famous song, topped the singles charts in both the US and Canada, and came out of a spontaneous onstage jam session during a concert in Ontario. This was the band's last album to feature Randy Bachman until he reunited with the band for a live album and tour in 1983. January of 1975 saw the release of Melissa Manchester's third album, Melissa. It peaked at number 12 on the Billboard 200 during its 41-week chart run. Its single Midnight Blue was her first top 10 charting hit, reaching number 6 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number 1 on the Billboard Adult Contemporary chart. It also reached number 5 on the Canadian Singles chart. Follow-up single, Just Too Many People, hit number 2 on the Adult Contemporary chart and was a top 40 Billboard Hot 100 hit. The album track, I Don't Want to Hear It Anymore, was written by Randy Newman. Also released 45 years ago this month was Gloria Gaynor's debut album, Never Can Say Goodbye. One of the earliest disco albums, it peaked at number 25 on the Billboard 200 and number 21 on the Billboard R&B Albums chart. It was also a top 10 album in Australia and New Zealand. The title track was a top 10 hit on the Billboard Hot 100, a number 1 hit on the Billboard Dance chart, and reached number 2 in the UK and number 3 in Australia, Canada, and Ireland. That single, along with Honey Bee and Reach Out, I'll Be There, both of which peaked at number two on the Billboard dance chart, formed a continuous 19-minute dance suite on side one of the album, one of the very first non-stop long-form dance megamixes. Happy 40th anniversary this month to The Pretender's self-titled debut album. It spent its first four weeks on the UK albums chart at the number one spot. It peaked at number nine on the Billboard 200, spending a year and a half on the chart. It was certified platinum by the RIAA in 1982. Its single Brass in Pocket was a top 20 hit on the Billboard Hot 100. Other singles include Stop Your Sobbing and Kid. The album is ranked number 155 on Rolling Stone's list of the greatest albums of all time. Also released in January of 1980 was The Buggles' debut album The Age of Plastic. Peaking at number 27 on the UK Albums Chart and receiving mixed reviews, the album was prompted by the huge success of their debut single, Video Killed the Radio Star, which topped the singles charts in 10 countries and peaked at number 2 in New Zealand and Germany and number 6 in Canada and South Africa, but just barely made the top 40 in the US. The single earned its place in the history of one-hit wonders by being the very first music video shown on MTV when it launched at midnight on August 1st, 1981. January of 1985 saw the release of John Fogarty's third solo album, Center Field. His first album in nine years, it topped the Billboard 200 chart and was also a number one album in Sweden and Norway, and it landed in the top ten in five other countries, including Canada, the Netherlands, and Australia. It currently enjoys double platinum certification in the U.S. The lead single, The Old Man Down the Road, was a top ten hit in the U.S. and Australia, and was the cause for the now legendary lawsuit Fantasy vs. Fogarty, in which he was sued for supposedly plagiarizing one of his own songs, which Fantasy Records owned. 
That's a fascinating story, by the way. You gotta look it up. Uh, the follow-up single, Rock and Roll Girls, charted in the Billboard Hot 100's Top 20. Both singles were Top 20 hits in Canada and Austria. Those two singles and a title track all peaked in the Top 5 of the Billboard Mainstream Rock Tracks chart. Also released 35 years ago this month was the Commodore's 11th album, Night Shift. Their second album since the departure of Lionel Richie, it was their last album to chart in the Top 20 of the Billboard 200 and the Top 10 of the Billboard R&B Albums chart. It reached number 12 and number 1 on those charts, respectively. The album's highest charting single and their most successful post Lionel Richie hit was the title track, a tribute to soul singers Jackie Wilson and Marvin Gaye, both of whom passed away the previous year. It topped the Billboard R&B singles chart and peaked at number three on the Billboard Hot 100 and scored the band their only Grammy Award for Best R&B Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocal. In January of 1990, The Sundays released their debut album, Reading, Writing, and Arithmetic. It peaked just inside the top 40 in the US, Australia, and New Zealand, but it reached number four on the UK albums chart. It currently holds gold certification in the US and silver in the UK. It was anchored by the single Here's Where the Story Ends, which became a modest hit in the US, reaching number one on the Billboard Modern Rock Tracks chart, but it wasn't released as a single in the UK. The album's preceding single, Can't Be Sure, charted at number 45 in the UK. Also celebrating its 30th anniversary this month is Flood, the third album by They Might Be Giants. Their first major label release, it was also their most successful. It spent 22 weeks on the Billboard 200 chart, but only peaked at number 75, though it eventually earned platinum certification by the RIAA in 2009. Birdhouse In Your Soul was the highest charting single, reaching number 3 on the Billboard Alternative Songs chart and number 6 on the UK Singles chart. The album also includes the fan-favorite track Istanbul, Not Constantinople, a cover of the Four Lads single from 1953. Reportedly, the production of those two songs plus two others consumed two-thirds of the 19-track album's budget. A quarter of a century ago, country artist Wade Hayes released his debut album Old Enough to Know Better. It peaked at number 19 on the Billboard Country Albums chart and topped the Billboard Heat Seekers chart. The title track became a number one hit on the US and Canadian country singles charts. The rest of the album's four singles, I'm Still Dancing With You, Don't Stop, and What I Meant To Say, all peaked inside the US Country Top 10 and the Canadian Country Top 20. Patti Loveless provided backing vocals on the album track Kentucky Bluebird, and the song Steady As She Goes was co-written by Brooks and Dunn. Also released in January of 1995 was Do You Want More, the sophomore album and first major label release by The Roots. Although it failed to break the top half of the Billboard 200, it peaked at number 22 on the Billboard R&B Hip Hop Albums chart and number 2 of the Heat Seekers chart. It achieved gold certification by the RAAA 20 years after its release. All three of the album's singles, Distortion to Static, Proceed, and Silent Treatment, were top 20 hits on the Billboard Rap Singles chart. The album's master recordings were amongst the numerous casualties of the Universal Studios backlot fire of 2008. In January of 2000, Finnish hard rock band Him released their sophomore album Razorblade Romance. It topped the album's chart and went triple platinum in the band's native Finland. It also hit number one in Germany and Austria and peaked in the top ten of the Billboard Heat Seekers chart. Three of the album's four singles, Join Me in Death, Right Here in My Arms, and Gone with the Sin, topped the Finnish singles charts, and the other single, Poison Girl, reached number three. Join Me in Death also hit number one in Germany and the top ten of the Austrian and Swiss singles charts. Also celebrating its 20th anniversary this month is D'Angelo's sophomore album Voodoo. It debuted at the top of the Billboard 200, knocking Santana's Supernatural out of position, and spent 33 weeks on the chart, receiving platinum certification within two months of release. It was also a top ten album in Canada, Norway, and New Zealand. Its most successful single, Untitled, How Does It Feel, reached number 25 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number 2 on the Billboard R&B Singles Chart. Left and Right and Send It On made the top 40 of the R&B chart. Time Magazine declared it their Album of the Year, and several other publications including Rolling Stone, Spin, The Village Voice, and the LA Times placed it in their top 10. Fifteen years ago this month, The Chemical Brothers released their fifth album, Push the Button. It was a chart-topping album in the UK and Belgium, and it reached the top 10 in Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, and Switzerland. Lead-off single Galvanize was the album's biggest chart success, hitting number 3 in the UK, number 11 in the Netherlands, and number 12 on the Billboard Dance Songs chart. Follow-up singles Believe and The Boxer peaked at number 18 and number 41, respectively, in the UK. All three singles charted in the top 40 in Ireland.
Also in January of 2005, Bright Eyes released not one but two albums, I'm Wide Awake, It's Morning, and Digital Ash in a Digital Urn, their sixth and seventh albums. I'm Wide Awake, It's Morning showcased the acoustic folk-based sound of the band and peaked at number 10 on the Billboard 200 and number 23 in the UK, while Digital Ash in a Digital Urn featured a more electronic sound and peaked at number 15 in the US and number 43 in the UK. Both albums made the top 20 of the Swedish album charts. During their debut weeks, Lua from I'm a Wide Awake It's Morning and Take It Easy from Digital Ash and Digital Urn occupied the number one and number two spots respectively on the Billboard Hot Single Sales charts. Blender, Q, Rolling Stone, and Time magazines all ranked I'm Wide Awake It's Morning in their top ten albums of the year. Happy 10th birthday this month to Lady Antebellum's sophomore album, Need You Now. It topped the Billboard 200 and the Canadian, Australian, and New Zealand album charts, and spent 31 non-consecutive weeks at number one of the Billboard Country Albums chart. It's been certified triple platinum and was the third best-selling album of 2010. The title track topped the country and adult contemporary singles charts in both the US and Canada, as well as peaking at number two on both countries' primary singles charts. It was also a top 10 single in five other countries and earned Grammys for Record of the Year and Song of the Year, and ACM and CMA Awards for Single of the Year. The album got a Grammy nomination for Album of the Year and a Grammy win for Best Country Album. Also released in January of 2010 was Contra, the sophomore album by Vampire Weekend. It peaked at number one on the US and Canadian albums chart and was a top 10 album in eight other countries, including Australia, Belgium, Norway, and Greece. It holds gold certifications in the US, the UK, Canada, and Australia. Six singles were released, three of which, Cousins, Giving Up the Gun, and Holiday, reached the top 40 of the Billboard Alternative Songs chart. Contra was nominated for a Grammy for Best Alternative Music Album. Rolling Stone and Pitchfork ranked it as their sixth best album of 2010, and Consequence of Sound declared it their Album of the Year. January of 2015 saw the release of Megan Trainor's full-length debut album, Title. It topped the album's charts in six countries, including the US, the UK, and Canada, and was a top 10 album in six more countries. It earned Trainer the Grammy for Best New Artist. Single All About That Bass garnered two Grammy nominations for Record of the Year and Song of the Year, and spent eight straight weeks at number one on the Billboard Hot 100, both replacing and being replaced by Taylor Swift's Shake It Off. Those two songs, by the way, shared the top two of the Hot 100 for 11 consecutive weeks, the longest run by two female artists since Alicia Keys and J.Lo back in 2001. All About That Bass became only the 10th song in history to spend 25 consecutive weeks in the top 10 of the Billboard Hot 100. Follow-up single Lips Are Movin' was a top 10 hit in eight countries and a top five hit in the US, the UK, and Australia. Also released five years ago this month was Mark Ronson's fourth album, Uptown Special. It was his first album to top the UK chart and his first top ten album in the US, peaking at number five. It also reached the top five of the Australian, Dutch, and Swiss album charts. It features appearances by Mike Snow's Andrew Wyatt and Tame Impala's Kevin Parker, as well as Stevie Wonder, and of course Bruno Mars on the smash hit single Uptown Funk, which sat at the number one spot of the Billboard Hot 100 for 14 weeks and what topped the UK singles chart for seven weeks. That single reached number one in over 15 other countries and the top 10 of 15 more, and received Grammy Awards for Record of the Year and Best Pop Duo or Group Performance. Okay, now let's go ahead and talk about the first Spotlight album of 2020. And yes, I'm only going to be doing one this month, uh, as opposed to most of the other months I'd like to do two albums each month. But uh, and doing just one album in January is probably going to be a thing more often than not for me, because, uh, well, if you're anything like me, your wallet's still recovering from the holiday season uh, by the time January rolls around, so uh, you know how that is, I'm sure. But uh, since I'm only doing one album this month, I wanted to make it a good one, and I did. This uh, album was released in January of 1975, so it is 45 years old this month. It is Blood on the Tracks, the 15th album by Bob Dylan. And this was recommended to me by my good friend Noah, and let's just say... I am going to trust Noah's recommendations quite a bit more from here on out because now, before I go any further, this is coming from somebody who is not a Dylan fan. Uh, I, I don't, I don't dislike or hate Bob Dylan. It's just taken me forever to get into his stuff. Uh, it's just you know he's got that weird vocal delivery, and you know his voice is not known for being you know spot on key or on you know in tone, uh, and he's also got a kind of a weird lyrical cadence. Is that what you call it? You know, kind of a weird delivery in his lyrics. So you know he's. He's arguably an acquired taste when it comes to music, and yeah, it's just taken me forever to get into him. I finally started really 
uh, taking notice of how good his music is, I guess you'd say, in the past couple of years. Uh, it's, it's Strangely enough, it's coincided, or maybe not so strangely enough, it's coincided with growing appreciation I have for country music. Because I've, it, it's occurred to me that country music and Bob Dylan's music have, two thing, have something in common, and that is storytelling. Country music has always been arguably the best genre for storytelling songs. And Bob Dylan, he started out in folk, and folk is really, really adjacent uh, in a lot of ways to country music. It's, in a way, it was kind of born out of country music. And I do have a few Dylan, actually I got them right here so I can reach and show you. Uh, I've got the Essential Bob Dylan, the Columbia uh, Sony two-disc set. I pretty much had to have that. And uh, most of the other stuff I actually inherited from my sister. She liked Dylan. Uh, I got a uh, live set from 1962, Live at the Gaslight, as well as two of his most recent albums, actually, Love and Theft and Time Out of Mind. Uh, but none of these have ever really, really struck me. I mean, I love uh, Like a Rolling Stone. I mean, that's one of the best songs ever of all time of any genre by any artist anywhere. Prove me wrong. Uh, but And, you know, I like a couple, of other, a couple of his other singles, but none of those releases have ever really struck a chord with me. And, uh, you know, I've listened to them repeatedly, but yeah, just none of them ever really clicked with me. And finally, when I started thinking about it, it really made sense in a way that probably the best bet for a Bob Dylan album to strike a chord with me would be one of his classic albums. And so I saw this one was coming up uh, for an anniversary, and also Noah cited it as a favorite of his when I was talking with him about Dylan several months ago. So I just had to give Blood on the Tracks a try, and I love it. If, if I had done this one last year, it could very well have been number one in my favorite Backtracks albums of the year. It's just... I. Every single song I was practically glued to. I don't know what it is that this one just struck a chord with me. Maybe it's the fact that I listened to it on vinyl. And, you know, all these other ones were CDs. I mean, you know, and, and again, this is one of the reasons that I love doing this backtrack segment is because I, I check out albums on vinyl. Vinyl is just a different listening experience than a CD or, uh, you know, a playlist on Spotify or whatever. It's just, it it's just has a way of just intrinsically getting you into the music. I don't know if intrinsically is the right word or not, but that's the word I'm using. But uh, yet, I mean, every single song on this album, I mean, uh, You're a Big Girl Now, that's the only one that kind of underwhelmed me. It just struck me as kind of an ordinary ballad. But pretty much every other freaking song on this album is just amazing and wonderful. And for the first time, I never thought I was going to say this about a Bob Dylan album, but it was over long before I expected it to be over. I would have thought that a Bob Dylan album would go on forever for me. But uh, yeah, this this one was just, and, and some of the songs are like seven, eight, nine minutes long. And still, this was just, it was just over so fast. And I, I've i listened to it a few times and it's just, and you know, Tangled Up in Blue, uh, Noah has good taste in music because that is just a fantastic opening track. Uh, Idiot Wind is a good one. Uh, Simple Twist of Fate, I really love that one too. And then You're Gonna Make Me Lonesome when you go, that's just a great country ballad, just one of those classic country kind of ballads. And I mean, you know, all the songs on the second side. I mean, just, you know, I could go on about nearly every song on this album, but this video is probably going to be way too long. Uh, Meet Me in the Morning, uh, Lily Rosemary and the, and the Jack of Hearts. That was a great song. It was one of the longer, more sprawling, more classically storytelling kind of songs. And, I, you know, what can I say? I mean, if you've had a hard time getting into Bob Dylan like I have, I would say give this album a try. It's just it's just fantastic. It, uh, as I said, it was over way too soon for me, and I never ever thought I was going to say that about a Bob Dylan album. I never thought I was going to like a Bob Dylan album, uh, but yeah, it's, as I said, it's got to have something to do with uh, my burgeoning appreciation for country music over the last couple of years, the storytelling aspects of songs. You know, it's, this, has, this basically cements in my mind uh, the fact that Bob Dylan is one of the preeminent storytelling uh, singer-songwriters ever. Uh, in you know, in all of popular music, this is just a fantastic album. The rest of 2019 is going to uh, have a lot uh, to live up to after this album. I'm telling you, this is just fantastic, an amazing, fantastic, awesome way to start 2020 for Backtracks. I cannot recommend this album enough. Go listen to it now. Uh, it's just fantastic. So yeah, there you have it. Uh, Backtracks for January of 2020 is in the bag, and you couldn't have had a better Backtracks to kick off the year with, could you? Or the decade. Uh, I mean, a fantastic Spotlight album, and uh, another pair of album shoutouts, stretching back to 1955. What more can you ask for, right? 
Uh, so, but yeah, just uh, don't count on me to surpass the number of Spotlight albums I had in 2019, though it's going to be quite hard to get past 25. I, I went a little crazy a couple months, so uh, I do hope to have at least two albums uh, each month going forward, uh, hopefully with December as well. We'll see. But anyway, uh, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, suggestions, questions, constructive criticisms, lay them on me in the comments section below. Also, scroll down to the description for the link to my Twitter feed and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure and ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.